public radio too now, baby. Hey, it's Dave Lawrence. Aloha, and thank you for joining me today. We have an exciting moment as we get to share in a new CD, a compilation that features some of Rock's biggest names, and it's a conversation with a gifted artist who is also our good friend. It's a new CD set that's out now, two CDs called Guitar Zeus Conquering Heroes, just the latest in a series of CDs under the Guitar Zeus banner. And it is a legendary drummer, too, from Vanilla Fudge, Jeff Beck, Ted Nugent, Rod Stewart, and many other groups, including his new Slam Project, the Innovative Drum Theatrical Project. It's my good friend, Carmine Peace. Aloha, brother. Hey, man. How you doing down there? Very oh, good. Are you all right? Yep, in Honolulu and Waikiki Beach, and congrats on the new record. All right, thank you. And you know, let me just straighten this out a little bit. The actual Ultimate Guitar Zeus that I released a couple years ago was the compilation. This is the full version. This this size, the two CDs, has Guitar Zeus 1 and 2 complete. It's just 24 songs total. Right. And uh, this one here um, is... The uh, Ultimate Guitar Zeus was remastered. This is remastered back to the original mastering, which I think was a was a better version of mastering myself. And uh, this, this CD sounds awesome. I remember, of course, that last one we heavily promoted together on the air. We were giving away all those yep. copies. You were uh, that was a a, mast a great way to summarize all of the Guitar Zeus. But now it's good be that you say you've returned it to its original form. And I wanted to yeah. sort of touch on some of these tracks and have you take us back to the recording process of this. And Dislocated is your first single. It's the one that has Paul Gilbert, also your band, Tony Franklin and Kelly Keeling joining you on this. When it was actually recorded with Paul, can you share a memory or story of working with him? Well, there's the four artists that did record in the studio with us. Uh, Paul Gilbert is one of them, unfortunately. Um, so we did the tracks, and we, and we put the track on a, uh, either an ADAT or one of those kind of uh, formats, and sent it to Paul in Vegas, because he was living in Vegas at the time. Right. And he sent it back to us with a completed guitar um, solo and fills, and, and even our sound. So it was easy for us just to take that and dump it onto the master, which was an analog master. Oh. <laughs> And uh, so then when we got it back, it, it, it did a good job. It sounded awesome. Yeah. And is he, uh, that's how the one with Paul happened. How did the one with Ingve Malmsteen come around? Well, I went down to Florida uh, to get Ingve. Ingve was one of the first ones I got. I got Ted Nugent, the two guys from uh, King's X, and Ingve was the next one. And I down to Florida in Miami. I stayed down there for two days, hung out with Ingrid for two days in the studio, and we put the, uh, the guitar on it. And he, he, was, he was very excited because he always wanted to work with Doug Pinnock, the singer of uh, King's, King's X. X, who actually sang on that track. So uh, Ingrid played totally different than I've heard him play on his own albums on, this, on that particular one. And is that the only time that you did recording with him, Carmine? That's the only time I ever recorded with him. I actually recorded with him also on uh, uh, his, one of his albums. Uh, I don't know if he actually used it yet, but I did do some recording with him. And where would you put him in terms of the guitarist? You've had the privilege of working with so many noteworthy guitarists. How do you think back to Ingve in comparison to some of the other artists that you've worked with that are, that are guitar legends? Well, you know what? I, I believe everybody's got their own thing. Everybody definitely had his own thing, you know. Stylistic. He, he had his own thing for sure. He was like a uh, um, a monster. You know, he was a monster. Was in his own right. You know, so we're just over here passing a Camaro, uh, a Chevy dealer in Kansas City with these Camaros outside, and me and Chuck are going, "Yeah, man, <laughs> I like this." The but anyway, uh, Ingve is, is definitely a unique guy. When he came out in the early 80s, he blew a lot of people's minds because he was so fast. There weren't many guitar players that had to be those days. 
Another another artist who, when he came out, much the same way, but in a different era, had a big impact was Neil Sean, and you have him on the record, and, and obviously Neil is someone who people know from Santana and from Journey and from his solo projects that he's done through the years. How, the, how did Neil come to be part of your life and part of the Guitar Zeus project? Well, I think I called Neil and asked him if he would want to play on it, because I know Neil likes music me to play on different... Uh, Things. He, he, you know, he, he likes to play on different things just to have some fun, you know. So I called him and asked him if he'd be interested. He'd go, yeah, man, I'd love to play on it. And I told him to play it and I sent him the song. And he was great with it. He came in, he had his, he had a uh, sort of a pedal board that put right into the board. He had it so, so quick. Two takes, he had it done. You know, and it was, it was amazing, you know. He had his echoes already on there, already ready to mix, you know. Right, nice and quick. I think he came in within two hours. He was in and out. And you know, as the producer of these projects, were, did, was that the role that you had at the time when you did the original Guitar Zeus One and Guitar Zeus Two? Yeah, I was pretty much a producer. I had a co-producer on the first one, but he did more of the uh, the uh, the sound production. You know, I I was one that organized all the guitar players and. and Set them up, and you know when we worked on the, on that particular um, part, I'm the one that said, "Yeah, let's do it this way, or let's do it that way," and you know, so I just let them blow and tell them where to play, and that. So I, I pretty much picked up the role as a producer on both CDs. And was it ever difficult to get what you wanted? Was there ever a moment of frustration where you said to yourself, "This is so difficult to achieve what I'm really looking for"? No. Not at all, because each one of these people I played on were professional, and they were they were good at what they did. So it wasn't hard to uh, you know tell them what we need, and they, and they went out and did it. And I must mostly everybody worked in one or two takes. The only one that I worked a little harder with was uh, Nick Mars because he never played slide on a record before, really. So I wanted him to play slide, be a little different. And he was up for that, but. Uh, and the, the song was in the time signature, and he wasn't that used to working in time signatures, so we worked a little longer than everyone else, but it came out great. I think he did a great job. Under the Moon and Sun, which we strongly supported here in Honolulu on the radio, which I was yep. uh, yep. proud to be a part of. That's my favorite song. Yeah, uh, that, that's your personal favorite from that? Say again? Was that your personal favorite, you're saying, from that? Yeah, it's one of my favorites, yeah. I like this. I, I like the sound of it. I think on the version that uh, we have now, Edgar Wood is saying on it. I'm not sure if Edgar was on the version before. Right. Yeah, that was a uh, you know another thing I was going to ask you about, and that's why I asked that question in terms of being a producer because you have so many stars on this record. When you look back at it now, especially putting the two of them together for this Conquering Heroes project, is there a moment in there that you think of as a highlight when you knew that this was going to be? It would really look the way it did an all star cast. Well, you know, I knew it when after I got Brian May, I had Ingray, I had Ted Nugent, I had the guys from the Who. Then I had other guitar players like calling me, you know, saying, wow, I heard you're doing this great guitar project, man. I would love to play on it, you know. So when people started calling me, I knew I had something going. Yeah. And that was after the first one, or at what point? On the first one, on the first one. Uh, when the second one came, it was, you know, once I, uh, you know, I did the first one, people heard about it. And it was easy to get people for the second one. And then you chose to remix the tracks for the ultimate guitar Zeus. Well, we didn't actually remix them, we remastered them. Okay. Well, mastered it. And it actually changed the sound of it a bit. It, it made it uh, sound different. It had not as much high mids and, and kick. And it had more bottom and more top, like more fidelity. Uh, so when we did these, I wanted to go back to the original master because I liked it better with the original master, you know. And uh, and it was never released in America here with the uh, original master. So that's how we did it. I'm glad today I just did a drum clinic and we played it on the PA system and it sounded awesome. And I played the ultimate guitar just on 
experience this and it didn't sound as good. Yeah, that's what that's what I was going to ask you about in terms of the difference between these, uh, in terms of the the project. And it is Dave Lawrence talking with drum legend Carmine Apice. He has an exciting new project out: the Guitar Zeus Conquering Heroes, the Guitar Zeus CDs one and two back to back, a compilation of both of these in their entirety. The original mastering of it, a two CD set that you can get now, and look for the link to buy at DaveLawrenceOnline.com. It's a privilege to get to talk to Carmine about it. And some of these artists, as you've been talking about at Carmine, I'm curious where you mentioned Brian May was sort of a signature artist, Brian May of Queen, that, that came to the project. It made you feel that these were going to have you know, some juice, as it were, in the business, that it was attracting other people to it. Did you ever think now, when you look back at that song, Black White House, that you did with Brian, it was almost ahead of its time with the lyrics? No kidding. I know, we were thinking about releasing that as the first track uh, from this album, but, you know, the one lyric that <laughs> sort of dated it was, that here we are, the year 2000. Right, you know? absolutely. If, uh, we would have put a, an S on that, the year <laughs> 2000, and we could have done it, you know, because I know, the lyric, I was just telling, uh, on the drive from Springfield, Missouri to Kansas City, we... Um, we were listening to the album uh, with, with me and Chuck, my, my DJ on the guy, and I said, listen to these lyrics, and, you know, they're like, they must have been ahead of their time, because now it's, you know, we call it White House, and here you have a, a black president, and it's pretty off the wall, you know? Absolutely, and in terms of their themes of sort of an apocalyptic future, and all the things that yeah, you, you know. Yeah, yeah, and all that, all that stuff, and the hole in the blue sky, and, right. you know, all that stuff is, is all happening now, you know. And uh, that was Kelly Killing's lyric, and he was, he's a visionary guy, you know. A visionary guy, is that what you said? Yeah, he's a visionary kind of guy. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's like, very much like John Lennon, you know. John Lennon was his... Was his main uh, influence in life, you know, and, uh, and he just he loved one, and he tried to do as much like one as he could, you know. And he was a great lyricist, you know. So I was very, very happy to work with him on this stuff. You know? When I spoke so, with, with Brian May of Queen when we were promoting the Ultimate Guitars, remember that? Yeah. yeah. And Brian. Yeah, that was cool. That was, and, and and he, as you know, in that interview, talked about the same thing that you just mentioned, about the lyrics being very ahead of their time, sort of complimenting uh, Kelly's work himself. Yeah. And you know what? We should get a copy of those uh, two interviews you did, so we could use them. Yeah, I would be happy to. Those are great interviews, and Brian May really yeah. spoke yeah. at length about working with you in the studio. And I was going to ask you, he, uh, you know, he couldn't point to the exact moment that he thought he met you. He's one of these guys that helps show how long, you know, your career has really been going on for generations. When you think back, what is your earliest memory of getting to meet Brian May? Of course. Say that again. I'm losing it. When you think of uh, of Brian May. Hold on, hold on, Dave, sure. Hold on a second, because I'm I'm walking into the hotel here and uh, again. When you think of Brian May from Queen in terms of how long your career has been, it's one of those guys that really highlights the, the longevity you've had, the many eras you've been through. And I was wondering if you could kind of think back through your mind. When did you first meet Brian May from Queen? I met Brian May in the Rockets when, uh, when we were recording at the record plant and Queen was recording there also. Oh. And uh, that was probably 19... Uh, 80. Okay, so, so it's been around for a few years, but, you know, um, it, but, yeah, it was around 1980, so then we, we, uh, played Europe and played the UK in the Wembley, uh, uh, Wembley Arena that year, oh. and then the guys from Spain came down, as we had met him in LA, we went to see parties with them and all that stuff, you know, and we were blind, became friends, and, over the years, we see each other in different things and different places and exchange numbers. And, and I actually, uh, I can't remember where it was. He was doing a clinic somewhere in a store. And uh, I was doing a clinic in another store, and we ran into each other. You know, and that's when I asked him if he would play on, uh, on my album. You know, and he said, yeah, he was left there. You know, so... 
Uh, he, he, he did a great track hey, on there. Hold on, hold on a second there, right? Sure. Okay, I'll take the shot. It's Carmine. What, what are you saying? Okay. I think we're just going to play it and go get you know, a glass of wine or something. Well, let's get Legendary the rock drummer Carmine of Peace we're talking to here on DLTV, DaveLawrenceOnline.com. Oh, Precisely, okay. All right, cool. Alrighty. Okay, I'm hey. back. Uh, <laughs> it's great listening to, to you uh, as you work it out there on the road. Hey, I wondered about how uh, there's a one of your guests on the record is uh, someone whose name has come up recently because of the death of, an, of the artist that really helped make her career so huge, and that is Michael Jackson guitarist Jennifer Batten. Huh? Jennifer Batten. Oh, yes, yes, okay, I got it. Jennifer. Yeah, I just saw her, actually. Uh, and, um, let's see, I did a, a drum festival in England last month, and it was a Saturday with the guitar festival, and Sunday was a drum festival. Right. It was there, you know, and, uh, So yeah, that that was I was that's cu that's interesting. So you just caught up with her at one of your recent drum clinics there in England, yeah, and yeah. she said yeah, it was like when I went to England at the time. It was probably two weeks after Michael died, you know. And uh, I'm reading the Michael Jackson book right now. You know, it's like 750 pages. Moonwalker. Yeah, and uh, who wrote it? Uh, who's the guy who wrote that book? What's it name? Cabarelli, yeah. Randy Cabarelli. Cambarelli. Cambarelli. Oh, Cambarelli. Yeah. Randy the biography. Cambarelli. Yeah. Probably he wrote some other books like Madonna and everything. It's a really good book. Yeah, I've yeah. taken a look at that. Really good book. What was she like to work uh, with? Well, Jack was great. So she lived in LA at the time. And she was always really good, eager and easy, you know, very easy to work with. Uh, And he, uh, how did he get yeah, involved I with... I don't any problems with anybody uh, being difficult on this. How did you get involved with Steven Seagal to begin with? How did he end up on this thing? Well, I got him to Richie Sambor. Richie Sambor was uh, on the record, and uh, Richie played on my record, and then he asked me if I would do this, uh, this, um, uh, what is it called? The, like a, uh... I think at the park it was for a charity, it's like a charity event, you know? Okay. So he asked me if I would do that with him. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to do it. So I went and played with Richie and also playing on that with Steven Seagal. So that's what that's another one of those things where, you know, he heard Richie played on my album and uh, Richie said, You should ask Steven, he'd love to play now. Um, so I said, Hey, you know, would you like to play on the album? Richie just played and he goes, Yeah, I'd love to play, you know? So that's how I go. It was pretty easy. Was he yeah, fun? Difficult, and everybody told me how difficult he used to work with. I never saw that part of him. You know? He was he was fun to be around. Yeah, he was great. I had no problem at all. You know. And you, but you uh, had good yeah, memories. Yeah, he was different. You know, he's a movie star. You know what I mean? He was he's a bit. Um, you know, he came in with his arms and a white limo. You know, even even when Flash came, you know. Flash didn't come in a white limo, and he came in some sort of SUV, and he just asked uh, if we have a couple of bottles of scotch there, you know, <laughs> or vodka, or whatever it was, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, but it was, so, I tell you what, it was definitely a really cool experience, the whole thing, because to me, you know, like you said, to get to produce all guys who are, you know, legendary guys and great guitar players and some of them newer and some of them old, you know, it was, it was a great experience, you know? And it was a great resume thing, too, you know? 
Oh, absolutely, for sure, and uh, and that's sort of a, a good place to put the interview at. And again, it is the legendary drummer Carmine Apice, a, a, a gentleman whose career has been through decades, through music fashions and genres that have come and gone, but yet he has endured, and he's done that by being able to touch on a lot of different kinds of music along the way. And he originated in the era of the Ed Sullivan Show itself, Carmine, can you take us back to some memories of that era of your life and getting to work in the 60s on TV on some of the shows that many people listening identify with? Well, we did all the shows back then. You know, we did the Ed Sullivan show. We did uh, the uh, Joey Bishop show. We did even like the Ray Anthony show, which was, these were like talk shows. We did the Mike Douglas show. Sullivan yeah. show. Who was on the show with you? I think the Temptations were on the show with us as well. Um, uh, the, the Mounts, uh, Fendesia, who was called the, uh, like a puppet mouse, uh, he was on the show. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, I remember one, that one time, I don't know who was on the second half. Huh? Leslie providing yeah, a name. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah, she she's got the uh, the memory, I tell you. And uh, yeah, so we we it's all these weird weird kind of uh, acts and you know play with. But the Temptations was a good one to be on with, you know. And was Ed friendly? Did was he? A, I mean, what is your memory of actually interacting with Ed Sullivan? Well, Fred, Fred uh, Ed wasn't really really friendly. I mean, he he come in the dressing room for a second before he went on and said hello, how are you doing, and all that. And then he would leave. And then uh, you know, after you play, you know, you go up to him and he would call you over and he'd say that was great, thank you. And he would say that was fudge, and that was really spread. So it was very quick. Yeah, but the Ed, Ed Sullivan productions, like now, have, uh, have been because, you know, I released this D drum, come on a piece, ES, kit, ES stands for Ed Sullivan, and it's the actual drum set that I played on the Ed Sullivan show. And uh, what they did was they gave me a copy, a clean copy of the Ed Sullivan show the first time when I played that kit to give away uh, for 50 of the drum sets. It's been a limited edition of 50 drum sets. Wow. So they gave me 50, they, they gave me a license to give away 50 of these performances with the drum set for free. You know, so they gave me a favor there. That was really nice of them. And uh, he, I mean, I had nothing to do with Ed, but you know, the, his company, you know. Right. No, I understand the connection there. He and and certainly in the last several, you know, in the last couple months, it's now been. It's really been, you know, I thought about those things more some of your early years because of all the Michael Jackson coverage, and you see Michael as a young kid on some of the same shows that that you were on right. uh, when you That's were doing right. it. Yeah. And and I wondered, had you ever just to make sure I didn't miss an opportunity to to find a story there? Had you ever crossed paths with Michael Jackson in your career? Not that I remember. No. Okay. Yeah, um, it's but uh, but certainly on your record, one of the one of the things that crosses generations on your album, and and is maybe an interesting thing from the past. And I don't know if you've ever worked with him. You have on the record Dweezil Zappa, and I was curious, had you ever worked with his father? We have actually. Uh, we were we were good friends, me and Frank. Uh, we worked with him at uh, first time at Westbury Music Fair in Long Island. And he opened up for Vanilla Fudge with Mothers of Invention. Okay. And, and then we, you know, we did some other shows with him around, you know. Matter of fact, uh, the night that we had that Mud Shark thing go on, you know, that uh, legendary Mud Shark story with Led Zeppelin. From the West Coast. I had told Frank Zappa the story at the Chicago airport. 
and Frank um, wrote a song for the Mother's Invention 1971 line at the film hall. It was called Munchak. And he actually talked the story out to a, a funky track going, Munchak! <laughs> in the background. <laughs> So this was a, uh, uh, on, it was, yeah, it was on a hit record. The, the album came out with this album, and, you know, went top 20, I believe, on a double live album at the film. That's great that you have that. So, and, then, and then, you know, Frank, uh, he was dying of uh, cancer, you know, I was talking on the phone with him, and, and he said, yeah, you know, we should get together, you know. I said, yeah, man, you know, I'll do so I get back from this trip, and when I got back from the trip, you know, he passed away. Yeah. How did you end yeah, up getting yeah. to work with Dweezil? Say again? How did you then end up getting to have Dweezil become part of your life? Well, you know, I, I know Dweezil was uh, playing around, you know, doing things, and, and I knew he was a pretty good guitar player, and I thought it would be cool to have him on there, as, uh, you know, because he was a sad but he was a good player. Yeah, I thought it would be a cool thing. You know, the funny thing about the whole record, when I did this record is in the late 90s, you know, grunge was king. So all these guys, like, you know, Sean wasn't with Journey at the time. Right. Journey was over. That's right. Yeah. You know, Ted Nugent what, didn't have a big following going on at that point. He, it's true. Yeah, his, his career was down. Everybody's career was down because all the grunge stuff was up, you know? Uh, Brian May Weather was clean. Um, Steve Morris just joined, joined uh, uh, Deep Purple. Um, who else? Uh, um, Vivian Campbell and Death Leopard. Yeah, their career was down at that time, you know what I mean? Right. So, when I got everybody, their careers were on top, like they are now. Now, everybody on the record, you know, you know, Slash, you know, was, was involved with the Revolver for a few years and brought it back up, you know, as far as his image and everything else. And Slash was doing a couple of solo albums at the time, you know. You were smart. Uh, you were like shopping at a fire sale. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I got all this guy that wanted, you know, Zach Wild was new. He, he, we was the only one that just came off that. Uh, Hot Ozzy album, No More Tears, and all that stuff, you know. He, he had just had all that, and, uh, you know, but, um, everybody else was sort of like, you know, in, in, in limbo, you know. But now, even Dweezil, I mean, Dweezil's a hot item doing that Zappa does Zappa. Yeah, they're popular. Yeah, you know, it's wild. You know, it's, you know, uh, Neil's back in Germany, they're back playing at Rena everywhere, and you got Jack Wilde is, is bigger than ever with his own group, and he was playing with Ozzy, and got bigger than ever, and uh, Ted Newton just got television shows, he's been all over TV, and you know, he goes down now and plays, you know, big shows again, and uh, <laughs> Brian May's back with Queen, you know, it's, well, it's, it's amazing what well, actually happening. We have a name for it. It's called the Guitar Zeus Theory. <laughs> you play, yeah, with right? <laughs> <laughs> play with that record, and and uh, you become a conquering hero. Uh, Carmine, let there me just go. let me pause this one more time for our final segment here. Okay. Certainly, one of the things that that Carmine has been able to do with his career is, as we've talked about, go with you know roll with the changes and flow in different directions and. This project, the Guitar Zeus Conquering Heroes, was one of those maneuvers in a career that had him paired originally with the Vanilla Fudge, and also as part of Rod Stewart's band for a period, working with Jeff Beck. And in the uh, career that you're, the latest chapter of your career, certainly the Slam project deserves some recognition and an innovative theatrical drum production, a percussion assault that is something that you go and watch and take in, but also you're listening to, you're seeing. It's visual and it's sonic. Where is that at these days, Carmine? Well, unfortunately, uh, the economy took its toll on Slam. We did we did gigs, and we also hooked up with a producer that was ready to put us on a television uh, special on HDNet, which still might happen. But unfortunately, we ran against the uh, Catch Twenty Two because the uh, we needed a venue that was big enough to put 500 to 1,000 people in it, plus big enough on a stage that we could 
by putting in, you know, some big production to make it and take the slam production up to the next level. To do the show, you know? right. So what, what we ran into was we couldn't find a venue that would want to, you know, even just pay for the, for the, uh, uh, you know, the house being rented and the lights and their lights and student security and whatever they needed. And then we were going to pay for the production. You know, because the economy, nobody wanted to take a chance with that, you know. So, we ended up doing, like, four big shows at, uh, or a couple of theaters, and we played Westbury, we opened up for a giant at the winter, and played a festival, and uh, played a couple of casinos. Probably. But now we're sort of out of the sand fill because of that TV show. So, but we did win a poll at Drum Magazine. We won uh, number two for the best um, drum show in the country, uh, Rita's Hall. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, now we're awesome. working on getting some more gigs for uh, 2010. We got maybe one, one other gig to do at, in the fall over here, and uh, oh, we're getting books, bookings for 2010. But it's, uh, it's an awesome show. And, you know, it's funny you talk about Rod Stewart. One thing I did when I went to uh, England this week, this month is I I played with all the members of the Rod Stewart band, all but one, and uh, with the idea of getting all of us together, because all of us together are the band that wrote all the songs that Rod pretty much played during the 70s, 76, 77, 78, up until about 82. You know, like we wrote uh, Hot Legs with him. We played on Hot Legs, we played Passion, we played Born Loose, we played, uh, we were the first band against the play Sweet Little Rock and Roll, uh, we were the first band to play Tonight's uh, Passion, you know, You're In My Heart, just a lot of all of his hits. Great you know, songs. Yeah, you know, Tonight, Tonight I'm Yours, you know. So what we, we're doing, we put the band back together and get another singer, and we're going to go out and actually play the whole lot of songs that we wrote with Rod, and we're going to call it the Honest G. Yeah. The music of Rod Stewart played by Rod's original band. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting idea. So that's something to look forward yeah. to. That's a new project. Yeah, so we've yeah, so been just kicking that around. We just did a photo of Ian Phil Chen, the original bass player. Right. He now plays with the Doors. And we sent the photo on to the guys in England, the three of them in England, to take an F photo. I did with Phil, and they're gonna make a photo to match it. And we send it to Billy Peak in St. Louis, and he's gonna do a photo to match it. And then we're gonna Photoshop it together. And uh, we got the Doors manager and the Colts manager uh, already working on stuff, and he's got uh, corporate stuff and some other things for us. And you know, they're also thinking of re-recording all the hits with the new singer. That way, we can go out to TV commercials also. Wow. That's exciting. That's very yeah, exciting. Yeah, it's really fun. You know, so, and then, you know, we got a lot of hits to pull from, you know. And one of the guys, Jim Cregan, went all the way up probably to the 90s playing with Rod. So he was on, you know, things like Infatuation, and uh, so we could even play that, you know. And, uh, and now there's a new Rod project coming out. It's called Rod Stewart Sessions, which has um, about... 60 songs on it, and 11 songs of it is the same Rod Stewart group, oh. in which we have songwriting, and we're on the album, you know, so, so that's all good too, you know. When should we expect to see some of this, uh, the dates and stuff laid out? Well, we're, we're you know, probably not until the beginning of next year, you know. Okay. And, yeah, and because it's going to take a little while to... To get the photo done, to get the one sheet done, to, you know, figure it out. And we'll probably get a couple of dates in uh, either England or in the New York area to fly everybody into a coach to actually put it together. So no more slam dates or just the one in the fall and maybe one more the next year or? Well, I mean, I'm working on more slam stuff. I just met with a new manager. Okay. To managers on uh, Monahan. And uh, he's taking it on to work and see uh, how we can get slam up to the next level. Things. I mean, there's no way I'm giving it up. Nah, it's too brilliant of an idea. I've really enjoyed. That's right. I think it's That's right. Really, a but you know, but 
I also need so I also need a better situation to play on to keep to keep my career you know moving forward because you know it's it's hard uh, to do it just with slam at this moment because nobody knows what slam is. You know? Right. No, I understand how that works. I can appreciate that. And uh, definitely put a lot of time and energy into it, so I'm not about to give up on it now. No, and I wouldn't expect nothing less from you. It's a very good project. I've always endorsed it and uh, been impressed with it. It's a cool part of your career. It's just a, as we've talked about, it's another chapter in your career, and it's a, you know something very creative that you got to do. Um, and a final yeah. note, just on your family, because I, I couldn't let you go without touching base on your drummer uh, brother, who has just made a huge comeback. I can remember the days when he was playing small clubs here in Honolulu to, to yeah, a, right? <laughs> a few hundred people and now he's playing in, in uh, places like Nebworth for, you know, 80, 100,000. Yeah, he just played yeah, just played Madison Square Garden uh, Theater uh, nights ago and uh, he's actually done, he's just finishing his last show tonight. I mean, he's going to go home. I'm going to see him next week. They're actually having a, um, a barbecue on Labor Day weekend and uh, for the family, so I'll be seeing Vinny there. But, you know, he's made an unbelievable comeback, and considering in those days when you saw him, even a year before that, he was working as a tech guy for Verizon Wireless. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because uh, often he was, you know, he, he got into being a tech guy, you know, and, and he did that for two years, you know. Well, and it's he came a, out of that, and then, you know, he's back in the, you know, big arena again, you know? Playing I mean, for uh, Heaven and Hell, later, anyway. the latest incarnation of, of Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, featuring uh, Vinny, and it's yeah. just, uh, it's unbelievable, and of course, it's, it's uh, no, no uh, surprise to anyone that he has that potential to come back, because that... That's another brand, as you know, that had had something left to be said with the Ronnie era. Yep. Oh. Yep. Well, I don't know what they're going to do now. They've done it all. They've done a DVD. They've right. done an album. They've done a world tour. You know, it's probably time to take a break from that now. Right. They've done three years. They've done three years of that already. Uh, three years in a row. Yeah, three summers they've toured. So exactly. I think it's uh, probably time to. Maybe take a break on that, and uh, Ronnie will probably go back to playing with Dio for a while, and you know, who knows? Yeah, they, yeah, they beat that thing hard. doing what he was doing. Well, it's a pleasure getting to catch up and, and hear about all these exciting things that are happening with this new Rod Stewart band. And obviously, folks should take a look at the uh, at this record and purchase it. Guitar Zeus Conquering Heroes 2 CD set that features... I mean, you can out. get it on uh, Amazon right now. And uh, I believe Best Buy is going to start carrying it as well. But, uh, it's for not just Best Buy, I think. I'm not sure if it's all of them. But certainly online, you can get it. Yeah, Amazon, CD Baby, all the normal places. And uh, you just put in guitar zoos, comment a piece of guitar, and uh, you'll see it. Right? And uh, I discovered a free pirate download site that already has it. <laughs> I guess that's a good sign that they've downloaded the pirating it already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I wasn't happy when I saw it. I, I emailed the, uh, the label and he said, uh, you know what, you shut these guys down, they just open up on another just the day after. So, so That's you true. chasing them, you don't get nothing accomplished. Cool, man. Hey, brother, let me just intro it. And it's Carmine of Peace. We're saying goodbye here on our special interview segment. We've had a lot of time to get to go over his incredible life. I urge you to take a look at Guitar Zeus Conquering Heroes. It is out now, two CD set, and of course we'll be constantly covering the updates from, from Carmine's exciting new chapter with the Rod Stewart guys getting back together to do uh, recordings and also to do touring and really... A, very smart of you to do, Carmine. You've done so many fun things, and thank you big time for sharing all these great stories with us. I hope you had a good time talking today. That was great. That was great. I appreciate you doing it, and I will talk to you soon again, all right? I appreciate it. Be safe and, and keep us in mind as you do stuff. We'll, we'll catch up with you okay. more. Do more you got it. Uh, I want to ask you something, too. Maybe you could put a little thing together for me, like that. Uh, yeah, a little bit of this interview on you know, some of the stuff with Slash and Brian and make like a little guitar use uh, piece and, uh, that we could you know, send out to some stations, you know? I'd be happy to try to. All right, I'll definitely. Uh, you want something, yeah. something of each of the things that uh, that I did. What was Slash? You mean when I I got to talk to yeah, him? Yeah, Slash and Brian, and you know, some of the stuff talking to me about the track. 
Yeah, your intro and your credit and blah, blah, blah. And then put it together and we can send it out to some of the other stations, you know? All right, I will definitely, I'll give you some of the audio of those. I'm, I'm grateful to always have had those interviews, by the way. They were fun to do. Cool, cool, fantastic. They were really cool. Hi, man, uh, keep in touch, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in Hawaii again. If not here, then uh, I'll see you. I told uh, Leslie I'm going to be headed to, to New York at some point in the fall, I think for Springsteen at the Garden in November. So, if that oh, okay. Will, I'll, I'll let you know when it when it happens, and maybe we'll be able to, okay, to see man. you guys. You got it, dude. I'll see you soon. Take care. Aloha, Carmine. Thanks again. Ciao, Take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. The legendary Carmine of Peace.